Thank you so much for uh, coming here. We have a good turnout. So, um, I'm Margaret Boitin. I'm a professor here at Osgoode Hall Law School. And I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Kevin O'Brien. He's the uh, Bedford Professor of Political Science uh, at UC Berkeley. He uh, focuses on Chinese politics and, uh, and law. And today, he's going to be presenting a paper that he's uh, worked on with Alexia Chan at Hamilton called Phantom Services, Deflecting Migrant Workers in China. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back in uh, Toronto. I haven't been here in a few years. The last time I was here was for a conference. And uh, the time before that, a little bit like this time, I was checking in on one of my uh, former graduate students. Margaret was one of my students at Berkeley. The last time I was here, I was here to see uh, Bill Hurst, who was at the University of Toronto then. And uh, uh, doing a talk there. I hope the students don't think I'm stalking them around the world. <laughs> Uh, they uh, can move on. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and today I'm going to be talking about migrant workers in China. Uh, as you, many of you would know, since the early 1980s, uh, higher wages have lured over 270 million people uh, to China's cities, uh, the biggest internal migration in world history. But after these migrants get jobs, uh, as you might expect, other needs emerge one by one. They come for the jobs, but they have other needs as well. Uh, newcomers who aren't assigned a room uh, in, a in a company dormitory have to quickly find a place to live. Uh, workers need medical care for when they get sick. Uh, migrants who lose their positions uh, can't count on unemployment benefits. Parents with children, of course, need the children to be able to go to school. So as migrants put down roots in a city and the years go by, they tend to expect more and the demand for public services grows. Now, when faced with the pressure to offer migrant benefits, um, city governments have three main options. Uh, provide them services, uh, deny them services, or what in this paper we call deflect them. Uh, the first choice, to provide them services, brings migrants into a city's social welfare system, at least to some degree. So for example, Shanghai in, in 2010 announced that it would give free education to all migrant children, while Chongqing and Xiamen now let recent arrivals apply for low-income housing. Uh, still, migrant workers' access to social services in general remains quite spotty in most places and depends very much on where they live. Now, a second approach uh, to providing services is entirely different. Just refuse to give them services. Uh, this strategy typically relies on the household registration, the HUCO uh, regulations, uh, to keep migrants out of the public goods system. So in Beijing, for instance, migrant children who don't have local registrations are often blocked from attending public schools. Uh, most cities require high school students to return to their parents' hometowns to take the college entrance exam. And very few municipalities grant people with rural household registrations el eligibility for medical insurance programs or for welfare assistance. So these types of discrimination systematically exclude migrants. Uh, keep them distinct from urban residents, and turn them into what scholars have called second-class citizens. Now, beyond these two options, there's a third way to, to dole out public services that neither includes nor excludes migrants, but deflects them. Uh, this city, this uh, approach is found in most cities uh, to some extent, uh, but hasn't been studied that much. Uh, cities that do this selectively provide benefits to some migrants, but not others so that they're not fully excluded, but find it hard to receive access to the services that they're owed. Rather than barring migrants by regulation, the authorities set eligibility requirements that at first glance appear to give migrants access to services, but when all is said and done, actually don't. So Dongguan in Shanghai, for example, allow outsiders to change their huko from rural to urban, but very few migrants qualify under a complicated point system that I'll be talking about later. Besides making it tough to meet requirements, many cities like Beijing and Chengdu ask for documents that most migrants are hard pressed to get in order to provide their eligibility for a service. Or city authorities may force a migrant to return home for medical care by refusing to accept their rural insurance. 
uh, in municipal hospitals. Uh, this paper, by the way, resonates much better in the United States than in places like Canada where you have universal services. Everybody says, okay, I know these kind of stories, uh, but there we are. Uh, in this talk today, I'll be highlighting ways that city leaders in China prevent migrants from receiving public services short of outright banning them. So I'm going to find ways they don't get them, but yet don't ban them. It's based on more than 130 interviews by my co-author, Alexia Chan, with officials, doctors, teachers, and migrant workers in seven cities. Uh, we supplement these interviews with information gathered from the national surveys, policy documents, government pamphlets, and on-site observation. Of uh, the many services that migrants get or don't get, uh, I'm going to just be focusing on two, healthcare and education. Uh, both are obviously crucial to China's long-term growth and are, of course, important to migrant workers themselves. Now, city officials have a lot of discretion over which migrants receive services and what procedures they have to go through uh, to get them. Uh, although the central government sometimes lays out broad out guidelines about how to incorporate outsiders in the public welfare system, uh, Beijing's day-to-day -day involvement in service provision is actually quite limited. In the end, local governments are in charge of formulating, funding, and providing services for migrants and their children. Uh, because migrants are managed locally and support from above is minimal, what that basically means is cities get to choose who to incorporate and who to leave out and on what terms they are to be incorporated. Now, taking advantage of this freedom, migrant workers uh, or municipal authorities have developed many ways to deflect uh, requests for services. Uh, at the city or the district level, this is quite low in China, Officials may make it difficult for migrants to send their children to school or participate in insurance schemes by requiring minimum periods of employment and residency. So, for example, in late 2012, Beijing city government announced that migrant children would be able to take the vocational school entrance exam if they met certain eligibility criteria. This is where I stray into law and society kind of issues, and this is why I thought this was a good paper to present here. But the criteria they established obligating parents to have full-time... Uh, the, the, the criteria they established obligated parents to have had full-time jobs for three years and to have contributed to Beijing social insurance for three consecutive years, while students had to have completed three years of middle school in Beijing. For higher-level vocational schools, parents were required to have full-time jobs for six years in Beijing and to have contributed to social insurance for six consecutive years, and their children had to have completed three years of high school in Beijing. But migrants tend to move around a lot. They go back to their home village for a time. Sometimes they relocate from city to city. For people who are this mobile, requiring them to stay in one city for a number of years in a row has basically the same as effect as excluding them from urban benefits. Now, besides setting minimum periods of employment or residence that few migrants can meet, another eligibility requirement involves the household registration system. And the HUCO system, even as reforms take place, can be used to tie migrants up in bureaucratic knots and keep services just out of reach. Uh, places like Chongqing, Shanghai, and Guangdong uh, have introduced point systems for getting residence permits. So as one example, in 2010, Guangdong province replaced temporary permits with residence permits that would supposedly make it easier for non-locals to get services, but which in reality didn't. Uh, this was because point totals are based on things like skill, education, social security contributions, and criminal records. High school degrees count for 20 points, university degrees 80 points, and criminal records lead to a deduction. Applicants need 60 points to qualify to apply for urban household registration. And the threshold is higher if you want to live in a very desirable city like Guangzhou. Now, one father reportedly went so far as to give blood three times one summer to try to accumulate enough points uh, for him and his son to apply for a Guangzhou hukou. Now, many migrants can earn some points, but few get enough to actually change their household registration. Now, these point systems make it appear that inclusion is possible and that clear rules exist to access services, but continue to exclude most migrants. And migrants know this. Uh, interviewees that uh, Alexia spoke to in Guangdong province were openly scornful about these residence permit reforms. A factory manager who employed 160 migrants in Dongguan explained, the residence permit and hukou reforms don't mean anything. It's still too hard to change your hukou. 
you need to have permanent employment and to buy a house. Now, most of his employees at this factory scoffed at the mention of Hukou reform. They had heard about it, but they said it'd be impossible to rack up enough points. Um, one of them even told, told Alexei, unless you have a, a PhD like you do, there's no chance I'm ever going to get there. So everybody in this room could qualify, but not the typical migrant worker. They said they could only afford to live in cheap rentals like shared rooms and basement apartments. They had no hope of being able to buy a home. And permanent employment also stood in, stood in, the, stood in the way of getting points. Many of the workers at the factory, like migrants elsewhere, switched jobs every few years uh, for better working conditions or higher wages. Uh, most of the people they knew in the construction industry also changed jobs often because their employment typically only lasts as long as it takes to build one building. So you build one building, then you move on, and you've officially changed jobs. So point systems create subtle kinds of de facto exclusion. Uh, they also favor some migrants over others. Uh, in particular, the poor and less educated lose out because they have few ways to earn points. Uh, in Shanghai, for example, they announced a new point system in 2013 uh, Non-Shanghai residents were allowed to apply, apply for a residence permit after being a temporary resident for seven years and amassing 120 points. As I was suggesting a minute ago, a master's degree is worth 100 points, a doctoral degree counts for 110. Uh, but most migrant workers, of course, don't have this kind of level of education. Uh, another way to get points is to undertake a financial venture that very few migrants can afford. If you invest in a Shanghai company that pays at least 100,000 renminbi per year in taxes, or has 10 or more employees, you can get points. That actually may sound more like Canada for what I've heard about. Uh, uh, although Shanghai has made it more feasible <laughs> on paper for outsiders to qualify for a residence permit, the point system in practice makes it no easier for most migrants to get services. So another way to deflect migrants beyond creating these near impossible eligibility requirements involves requiring hard to secure paperwork. Uh, even when migrants get enough points, they often can't track down the documentation they need to prove they're entitled to a service. City governments generally require five documents, they're called wujong, uh, for uh, migrants to be eligible to enroll in public school or get health insurance. You need a household registration booklet, proof of hometown residency, a temporary residence permit, proof of local address, and proof of employment. Some cities like Chengdu, which actually is quite good for migrants, uh, want up to seven documents. Now, from the vantage point of migrants, at least three of these documents are very hard to get. Uh, the temporary residence permit, the proof of local address, and the evidence of employment. Uh, not everybody has a temporary residence permit because it means registering with the Public Security Bureau. And some people don't want to do that. Uh, getting proof of local address is also hard. As the shortage of affordable housing grows, uh, migrants often share temporary housing, and they often aren't offered leases with their names on them that they can use as a proof of residence. Uh, even if they have a temporary residence permit and they can show they have a local address, many, labor, uh, many migrants don't have labor contracts that they can present as evidence of employment. Uh, informal and low-skilled workers are among the least likely to be on contract. In many small businesses and much of the underground economy, written labor contracts are rare. So you th imagine you know, fruit and vegetable sellers, nannies, repairmen. Uh, these people generally don't have contracts, so they can't give them over to the city and show that they've been there. Migrant workers if, who can round up all the needed pay for work still often can't access services. Um, some workers who sought labor contracts when they began their jobs are never given them. So they're not in a position to submit a copy of their contract to confirm their employment status or how long they've worked in a job. Uh, without this documentation, they can't show they've met the eligibility requirements for urban residents or services. Uh, after the 2008 labor contract law was enacted, one feisty migrant worker in Guangzhou took his boss, boss to court for not complying with the law. Uh, the court sided with the employer and ultimately blamed the worker for not signing a contract, even though the company refused to give him one uh, after he asked for it when he was hired. So it was his problem. In addition to requiring migrants to submit paperwork they often can't get their hands on, the city authorities also make it difficult for non-locals to have documents verified. Uh, even when migrants qualify according to all the criteria and can round up every piece of paperwork they need, uh, they may still be shuffled from office to office in a fruitless effort to get their piles of forms certified. 
unless Canadian universities are very different than American universities, you all know about this as well. Um, I tell my students all the time, you think you're treated like numbers, faculty are treated like numbers just as well. Uh, for instance, some officials in Beijing started stepping up enforcement of document checking rules uh, around 2007 at a time when the migrant population in Beijing was growing very rapidly. Uh, previously, the document review process had been informal and parents could simply bring the paperwork to a school for clearance when they registered their children and pay their tuition and fees. But once tighter examination of paperwork began, local officials began to step in and send migrants on wild goose chases. Uh, some schools in Beijing now instruct parents to bring their full package of documents to the local government um, to, for inspection and get a certificate verifying that the documentation is complete. Uh, one migrant in Beijing that Alexia talked to uh, who tried to follow the new procedures was given the runaround. At a local government office, they told me to take the document straight to the school. By the time they cleared up the document approval, it was too late. The school year had started, and I was told to try to enroll my child again next year. With both school leaders and local officials dodging parents and sending them to another office, migrant workers can end up in approval limbo and never make the leap from being technically eligible for a service to actually enrolling in school. Deflecting migrants uh, after they've arrived in a city by setting hard to meet eligibility requirements or asking for paperwork that's hard to get, uh, from our vantage point, has two really important consequences. Uh, first, it isolates them. Uh, it isolates migrants. It shifts the blame for missing services away from the government and onto migrants themselves. By establishing unrealistic criteria, city officials make it the responsibility of each migrant to qualify and apply for benefits. New arrivals can't claim collective exclusion and discrimination and instead have to throw themselves into fending for themselves in case-by-case -case battles over eligibility and documentation. Second, when migrants fail to overcome the obstacles to buy health insurance or get their kids in school, uh, we found that they often assume it's their fault and they blame themselves for being unable to get the services they expected. Now, migrants not only deflect, um, officials not only deflect migrants within a city, they also encourage them to just go elsewhere and just get the services somewhere else so they don't have to provide them. Uh, by selectively enforcing rules, by shutting a service down, or funneling them toward cheaper and more convenient options, they divert migrants to clinics and schools in other cities or their hometown uh, in the countryside. Now, the first way to channel migrant requests elsewhere involves enforcing dormant rules. Uh, I think this, this touches on issues that I'm, I'm sure you think about in a law school as well. There are lots of rules out there that are not being enforced at any given point in time. When you want to deflect somebody, what you do is you, you dig through the pile of rules that exist and you, you dredge them up and you start applying them. Now, there are lots of regulations in China that have been on the books for a long time but have been unenforced until city leaders, principals, or hospital administrators decide to apply them. So, for example, the limits on the number of students allowed in a classroom have existed for as long as interviewees could remember, um, but always were ignored. Maybe some of you from China will remember this. Um, in the past, when class size grew, most schools happily collected the additional fees and crowded more desks into a classroom. That does sound like Berkeley. We just keep putting people in to the same classroom until we run out of desks. As more migrant students enrolled and anti-outsider sentiment grew in the mid-2000s, some officials dusted off these classroom size restrictions and used them to exclude migrant children. In Beijing in 2012, education bureaus working with principals abruptly restricted class size to 30 students. While in Chengdu, they cut it to 45, even though classes had long been at 55 or 65. Uh, an education official in Chengdu explained, we're strictly enforcing the limit of 45 students per class. So we now require a parent's hukou registration. This is enforcement of a policy that always existed, but it wasn't carried out before because now there are too many migrant students. That's pretty clear. Now, tighter compliance with class size limits reduces the number of spots available without being openly discriminatory, unlike this last sentence, which really is pretty openly discriminatory. Restricting student numbers deflects primarily migrant children because most schools fill their classes with registered students before allowing in any migrants. So the registered people in the city get in first. Migrants have to get a number on the waiting list and maintain high enough test grades in the meantime. 
When they move from elementary to middle school, they have to get another number and go to the bottom of a new list. One NGO staff member who had been working to integrate migrate ch migrant children with registered students explained that this avoided the awkwardness of ex excluding migrants formally by making their inability to enroll a result of rule enforcement and class movement management and capacity rather than outright discrimination. Or as one migrant parent put it, the school said they were full instead of saying that they weren't allowing my daughter to enroll. Enforcing previously enforced rule, unenforced rules keeps migrant students out of urban classrooms and often forces their families to send them to private migrant schools or schools in their parents' home village. Now, besides enforcing dormant rules, cities sometimes withdraw services they previously offered. They may, as been common in Beijing, shut down schools attended by migrant children to encourage them and their families to move away, often to dampen opposition to urban redevelopment projects. In Fengtai District uh, in Beijing, uh, local uh, officials put up barriers around four migrant schools and very cleverly posted signs saying that demolition would begin in one year. There were no other announcements about the plans for the neighborhood. Migrants didn't have the option to send their kids to a public school because there weren't any nearby. <coughs> Most migrant families in Fengtai decided it would be best to make plans to relocate as soon as possible before that year transpired. They realized that if they waited and demolition began, they might lose out and be forced to move without having found new jobs, housing, or schools. In the year after the signs were posted, many moved to other parts of Beijing, relocated to new cities, or returned to their home villages. And this happened in other places too. As China's cities expand in size, municipalities throughout the country are demolishing neighborhoods and evicting residents to make way for more profitable projects like luxury malls and residential high-rise buildings. Since at least the mid-2000s, uh, dozens of migrant schools in Chengdu and other cities have been demolished as neighborhoods have gone through um, urban renewal. And Shanghai has been particularly adept at getting migrants to leave redevelopment zones uh, with little fuss. Uh, in 2012, one migrant school in Minhang district was scheduled to close one year after demolition project began. Uh, the year's warning gave residents time to prepare to depart and to find a new place to live. One NGO staff member uh, could see what lay ahead. Uh, she said, one year from now, the whole neighborhood will be demolished. Most families have already moved out. So get them to move out before you demolish. Now, that will to take away services, and then doing it helps preempt organized opposition. Uh, local leaders and development companies they cooperate with prefer to avoid confrontation with the people they're displacing. I've been also writing on uh, uh, demolition, but that's, a, that's another interesting topic. Since prolonged disputes can lead protesters to dig in, uh, it can draw the attention of the media, and it can bring criticism if a long dispute goes on. Uh, city officials hope to defuse conflict by encouraging migrants to move away on their own without the forcible removal that has been so common um, for the last decade or so. Besides thwarting resistance uh, by preventing a critical mass of protesters from forming, uh, withdrawn services gives an air of necessity. and is often combined with the language of an inexorable progress and moving ahead and uh, creating a, a new society. As an Education Bureau official in Chengdu put it, a migrant school would never be demolished, per se. Rather, if there's an issue, it's simply a question of land being bought for necessary development. Now, city leaders don't always go as far as withdrawing services. In healthcare provision, especially, uh, they sometimes take advantage of the differences between urban and rural services to push migrants toward the countryside uh, or to a lower level of treatment in another city. Uh, urban hospitals are almost always more expensive than rural ones, and differences in out of pocket expenses um, can encourage migrants to get healthcare outside the city where they work. A combination of lower premiums, higher reimbursement rates, and simpler reimbursement procedures in the countryside and less developed cities makes going to a rural health clinic or a smaller city a cost-effective choice. Here's one example. Now, most migrants there could only get 10% of their expenses reimbursed. Another issue Canadians are going to have a hard time fully appreciating, Americans get immediately. Uh, because of this, a worker from rural Zhejiang planned to wait until he returned to his hometown to have colorectal surgery. Although he could have received care in Hangzhou, he wouldn't think of doing it unless it was life-threatening. 
another migrant from Anhui province who'd been admitted to the same hospital was in great pain and urgently needed surgery. Uh, she couldn't afford the 90% share of a 5,000 renminbi bill, and she didn't want to take time off from work to return to her home village. When the patient suggested she might have the procedure at a cheaper, less reputable facility, uh, the doctor said she'd likely have to spend more time later uh, and more money later to get corrective work done. Uh, in the end, the woman left the hospital without scheduling the surgery and just hoped her condition would get better. And her meager 10% reimbursement rate isn't as bad as it gets. Some migrants with reinsurance find it impossible to use their insurance. Uh, this isn't because they're formally excluded, but they might as well be. Uh, municipal officials don't try always to set up agreements with rural healthcare providers and rural insurance programs that will enable people to get reimbursed for medical care they receive in the city. If you don't have these agreements, um, and you would need them with lots of places all over the country where all the migrants came from, uh, you have a hard time using urban hospital receipts to get payment from rural insurance providers. <coughs> now, pushing migrants to use services elsewhere obviously affects their quality of life, uh, but it also has political consequences. Um, deflecting migrants isolates them again, like I said in the first part of the talk, and depoliticizes their claims. Enforcing dormant regulations undercuts the claims for exclusion and the claims that you're of prejudice. Relying on existing but previously unenforced rules makes it hard for migrants to allege discrimination since the rules exist and they do, the rules do predate their claims. Urban sprawl and higher healthcare costs in cities disguise the origins of why it's necessary to go home to get medical care or find a school. All of these together generate feelings of powerlessness and uncertainty about where to turn. It feels, uh, often feels, interview, he said, like no one deprived them of anything. It just happened. When faced with class size limits, development pressures, and lower reimbursement rates, it's hard for migrants to know which institution is responsible. Is it the school, the hospital, one of the government departments involved? Which level of government is responsible? Is it the district, the municipality, the province, or the center? Or even which person? Is it the principal, the hospital cashier, or an official from the Bureau of Education, or from the Department of Public Security? <coughs> you know, if naming, blaming, and claiming is part of what you're doing, it's hard to know who to blame. And that undermines your claim. Without clear targets, collective protest, or even collective consciousness, is hard to muster. Now, city officials use phantom services to depoliticize and de disempower people who might be engaged in protest. Uh, they also deflect migrants for many other reasons. Uh, the simplest one is cost, and I don't mean to downplay this because it's, it's an obvious one, but it's just not the focus of this paper, but it's of course important. And in 2013, the Chinese Academy of Social Science estimated it would cost $106 billion uh, um, every year to ensure that rural migrants enjoyed the same health care, housing, and school benefits <coughs> as urban residents. It's, of course, very challenging for city officials to foot this bill largely on their own when the central government only accounts for about 8% of spending on public services, 6% on education, and 1% on health. So, but if services are too costly, why not just refuse to provide them? And this is where it gets interesting, I think. You know, several initiatives in the 2010s, including the National Urbanization Plan, have made it clear that the central government wants cities to improve benefits for migrants. In July 2014, the State Council announced the goal of eliminating the difference between rural and urban HUCO and accommodating 100 million new city residents by 2020. Central officials then and since have recognized the need to improve services for migrants, and they've frequently uh, focused on the importance of a people-centered approach to urbanization. To this point, though, they've provided very few details about how any of these goals are going to be achieved. So this leaves city leaders in a tough spot, and I'm not trying to turn them into villains at all here, because they're expected to extend services, but they have very limited resources and little guidance about how to do so. Now, while central officials are encouraging more urbanization, they don't want crowded first-tier cities to become much bigger. Uh, instead, their goal is to push migrants towards small and medium-sized cities. 
Uh, now, most of you in Canada or even the United States, you can't even appreciate what I'm talking about when I say a small or medium-sized city. There are dozens of small cities in China that are over a million people that people like Margaret and I have never heard of. Uh, so we're talking about a million or two million people rather than five or 10 or 20 million people. And that's where they want people to go. This means that hookah liberalization is taking place mainly in cities with fewer than five million people. But most new jobs are created in the larger cities, bigger than five million. And those are the cities where migrants generally want to go. Now, the clash between the central government's urbanization strategy and migrants' preference for bigger cities puts leaders in places like Shanghai and Beijing in a very tough spot. The new migrants appear daily, and the center urges them to give more benefits. Uh, and this is what encourages China's larger cities to de uh, deflect migrants rather than just deny them straight out, because they are getting pressure from above. You can't just not give them to them. It's better to come up with some ploy that makes it look like we're giving it to them, but doesn't actually cost us anything to do it. So top leaders in first-tier cities often feel hamstrung. Uh, they agree it's wise to control overpopulation, but on the other hand, until more jobs, higher wages, and better quality services lead migrants to move to smaller cities, they know that migrants are going to keep coming to the biggest cities, and they're going to keep expecting services. So Huco reforms and an urbanization plan that focuses mainly on third and fourth tier cities uh, don't offer much for major cities who face migrants who demand benefits and want to live in Shanghai or Chengdu. They don't want to live in Banxi or Datong or other places that uh, there may be jobs and their services may be available. Beijing's a good example of this mismatch and the reasons why deflecting migrants is so appealing in China's megacities. In December 2015, Beijing released regulations on permanent residence requirements that said Hukou as a res applicant should have a Beijing permit, be less than 45 years old, have paid social insurance for at least seven consecutive years. They also set up a point system, a lot like the one in Shanghai and Guangzhou's, which I talked about earlier, and which is probably going to have the same effect. Although some migrants may clear all the hurdles, and there are more upper class migrants now working in areas like uh, being a uh, real estate broker. Most of them will not. Um, most migrants will continue to be effectively excluded <coughs> from services despite reforms that suggest the central government wants to integrate them. Deflecting migrants, I'm arguing, makes sense both practically and financially, and it allows officials in first tier cities to make it appear that they're addressing a problem without actually doing so. So what's the take home of, of this presentation? Uh, well, as China urbanizes, more migrants need and expect public services. Most cities deflect them instead of meeting them or denying them outright. Within cities, uh, the authorities establish nearly impossible eligibility requirements or require paperwork that outsiders struggle to obtain. Municipal leaders also nudge migrants to seek health care or education elsewhere by enforcing dormant rules, shutting a service down, or encouraging them to pursue cheaper options somewhere else. City leaders deflect migrants for both political and practical reasons. Limiting access isolates and disempowers migrants and is cheaper than offering benefits. It's also politically appealing at a time when the central government's calling for greater benefits for law and locals and urging people to move to small cities, but city leaders have to deal with migrants who continue to appear in large numbers in the biggest, most desirable cities, which is where all of this research was done. There was uh, no research done in the smaller cities. Now, migrants, of course, aren't alone in being reflected. Other people seeking services may also be diverted by a tangle of rules and complications that channel them into negotiating on the state's turf. That's part of what's going here. You're being pushed onto the state's turf to negotiate in their offices on with their rules, and you at a structural disadvantage. For example, rural leaders have used guidelines about which homeowners can receive low-income assistance to disqualify evictees and reduce opposition to land expropriation. Uh, nor are schools the only service that can be taken away to encourage people to move elsewhere. Uh, officials in some cities have cut off water, gas, and electricity to push people who are resist resisting demolition orders to move out. I have one student who just finished a, a dissertation on something she's calling blunt force regulation, where to deal with pollution regulations, what they do is they go in and they turn off the electricity in a factory and turn off the water. And if that doesn't work, uh, she's got wonderful pictures of them just blowing factories up. You know, that, that is definitely a way to get things uh, gone. In today's China, deflecting is a handy tool in the social control toolkit. 
and that is justified by a steady flow of pronouncements about development, modernization, and progress that makes it even more appealing to local leaders than providing a service, or taking the more politically risky step of refusing to offer service. Now, the long-term effectiveness of providing phantom services remains to be seen. It certainly works in the short term. And maybe that's all people are thinking about when they're doing this at the municipal level. It works in the short term in preventing a migrant from getting health care, education, housing, a pension, or low-income assistance. But if deflective becomes a norm, a local adaptation will have become much more than a stopgap. You know, after years or even decades of waiting for a thoroughgoing transformation of the HUCO system, uh, some migrants are losing their patience. Uh, they, or at least migrant activists, are overcoming the depoliticization and the individualization that lie at the heart of deflecting and are making their frustration known. Instead of helping preempt protest, uh, there's some evidence that diverting migrant migrants is inspiring mobilization. Uh, protest is increasing the most in areas where the migrant population has grown rapidly. And labor protests have been growing in number at a, a very rapid rate, and many of them involve migrants. And they are intensifying as the economy slows and workers aren't getting the benefits they're owed. So our final point is that deflecting is not really addressing the needs of China's urban workforce, nor is it clearly serving social stability. It definitely saves cities money, but it may only be pushing other problems down the road and making their ultimate resolution more difficult. Okay, I'll stop there. So for questions, we'll pass the microphone around. Wonderful presentation. I just wanted to ask about the economic consequences of, of uh, uh, keeping the migrants from staying in the larger cities. Uh, cheap labor was why they came, in good part. Uh, if you force them to leave, who replaces them to do the work that they had been doing? They were doing things in Beijing and Shanghai. If they're forced to leave because their children can't get educated or they don't get medical care, Who's going to come in to replace them, or is it going to the city population itself have to step down to do the lower income jobs that they were doing? Some of it is people coming behind them. There's another set of migrants who are hoping that the future is better for them, even though other people are leaving. The other thing is that China is really moving up the value chain. And uh, in, it's hard to believe, but there is, there is a labor um, shortage in some places, but generally at higher levels. So some of these lower level jobs are not as needed as they were in the past. So the migrants are not uh, taking them over. They're being, uh, they're, they're being done by people who are, are residents of the city. Um, but it, you know, it, is, it is a good question. I don't know how many people have actually left. Uh, they've sometimes moved to other cities. They've sometimes moved to another city. Uh, at, at this point in time, the population of the largest cities is, is close to flat. It's not increasing as much. This is not a Latin American kind of story where there are shanty towns uh, growing up on the cities. And at least in theory, if we know this, certainly the migrants know this, and some of them are leaving. Some have gone home. There were a lot of questions after the 2008 financial crisis. Were people going to go home? Some went home, but they almost all came back. Uh, as far as we can tell, most of them are still toughing it out. They're frustrated. Um, they often feel defeated by the process. Not that fewer than you would expect have moved to smaller cities, even though that's the pressure put upon them. Um, by the central government, and that's what they're being induced to do by local governments. Well, they still have the jobs. They, so, still have they still have the jobs. I mean, they the still have the jobs. The city still needs them, but they don't have the services, yeah. and their demands are not going away. Yeah. So they're, you know, that's where the protest comes in at the end. They're still frustrated that uh, the, the jobs are still there, and people move very quickly, migrants, from year to um, Some of them are in jobs for just months at a time and move on to another one. And wages have been increasing quite generously, some years 10 and 15%. But the services end of the puzzle has been a harder one to address. And I should mention, this is not a paper about variation. This is a, a lumping paper where we're just trying to identify a phenomena. Uh, in Alexia's dissertation, she divides these cities up among themselves and also looks at others and looks at variation 
which is obviously a very important question. And there's some interesting findings there, like Chengdu is particularly good at dealing with migrant workers uh, compared to a place like Shanghai. So it's not simply wealth. That if you're a richer place, you can deal with migrants better. Chengdu is poorer than Shanghai, but they've set up better systems to deal with migrants. So this is a paper that's just trying to identify a phenomenon that we call phantom services. There would be variation from city to city, even among the megacities. Uh, and her dissertation, soon to be book, uh, should, should be dealing with those questions. But you're right, they still have jobs. So the jobs haven't really gone away. Uh, and the fact that there is a labor shortage, uh, if, if anything, is helping them. It's hard to imagine China with a labor shortage. Uh, but there, there, there we are, if you talk to the economists. Um, is, but the services have not, got, have, gone, have not gone apace with the wages and the job opportunities. And that, that's what this paper is about. Uh, thanks again for the microphone. Uh, Sun? Sun? Yes? Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. One is about the method. I noticed that uh, the cities that, I mean, uh, included in the, in the research, most of them, I mean, the majority is, um, are big cities, but there's just, I mean, a city that doesn't fit Dongguang. I mm -hmm. think that has nothing to do in terms of size and, and, and importance with the others. So I was wondering, or why it is included if there's a particular reason that I mean makes it special and and worth including. And the second uh, question is about uh, uh, the the implied uh, uh, criteria that I mean or a hidden criteria used by the local administration to uh, deflect uh, immigrants. Is regionalism one of these? You think so? I think that they look at differently uh, at the place where the, at, uh, the, 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 the origin of the, the migrants. So they tend to protect more people from uh, the same region, same area. Or this has nothing to do with uh, the, their decision to to help or not to help or to help less. Oh, that, that's interesting. Um, Dong Guan, I know, was added as a, a matter of convenience and that Alexia had some connections there so she could do work in Dong Guan. Dong Guan is also important because it is the heart of the traditional labor, uh, the migrant laborer experience, particularly in uh, lower skilled sorts of jobs. So that's one reason she wanted to look uh, in particular at Dong Guan. The rest of the cities are almost all of I think all of them are provincial capitals and there are special characteristics you want to look at when you think about a provincial capital, that a provincial capital is treated differently uh, than other sorts of, of cities, uh, not least because you're also so close to the provincial government and you can end up on the provincial government's doorstep if something goes wrong. That's a special pressure uh, municipal workers. I haven't, um, you know, I just worked with her on this one paper and are talking and reading her dissertation. I haven't heard about native place ties and if there are important differences in native place. Uh, some migrant workers in cities have moved up in the world. There are some people with uh, Lao Jia or Jia Xiang uh, connections to people in certain places. I know in Chengdu there are very clear paths uh, uh, that people go from the, uh, Chengdu uh, to the countryside and large groups of people come. I know some factories are dominated by people from one area or for another area, but at least talking to her, and I haven't seen the later part of the uh, the later version of the dissertation in the last two or three years, uh, if there are systematic treatments and differences in treatment based on uh, where people came mm. from. Now, there's a lot of rural to rural migration in China now. There's a, there's a migration is not only going to these big cities. And one of the important things about variation is she's looking at a very particular migration path, which is to the biggest, most prominent cities in one area, with probably the exception of Dongguan. And I could imagine a wrinkle uh, like that could, mad, could matter a lot in that in, in this place, people from uh, Hunan would be treated better. And in mm -hmm. another place, these people from elsewhere would be treated so better linguistically. linguistically and depending on whose factory it was and who set it up and how they found labor to begin with. And a lot of times, you know, a factory is set up with uh, a person who then does tap into his or her home network to draw the first batch of, of workers to the factory. It would be interesting to know if uh, original uh, s native place origin or how long you've been in the factory or those kind of issues makes a, makes a difference and whether this deflecting strategy can disappear uh, you know, or not be used because this is uh, you know, or used selectively uh, on different people at different times. So 
two questions. One, you, you did talk a little bit about this towards the end, but um, so you, you said there was a sense of helplessness, uh, and I kept thinking about, is there no sense of resentment? And so in the end you said, well, there is a little bit of that, but isn't there worry? For, I mean, the numbers that you mentioned, 270 million, I'm sure not all of them are in that situation, but still the numbers are, are significant. Is there no worry of some kind of um, more active demonstration, resistance, and so on? So that's one. The second question is much more down to earth. So, so what do these families do with children who can't go to school, like for example? Um, so is there, for example, some kind of organization of among themselves, the migrants start organizing their own kind of systems of, of re even taking care of the children or something like this is, uh, because otherwise I can see many children, for example, just focusing on that, that seem to have nowhere to go. And, and their parents obviously have to go to work so they can't take care of them. So what's, what's happening with that? Some children are sent home. There are tens and tens of millions of children who are sent home to the village that their parents take care of. They call them left behind children. And there's a big literature in sociology, anthropology. If you read a journal like Journal of Peasant Studies, you'll read about what that does to a society when so many uh, children have been sent back to their home village and their parents are away. Um, they're, they're raised by grandparents is, is a very common thing. The migrants also set up their own schools in various places and that has had more or less success um, and um, they do it with their own resources outside the system, uh, and that occurs sometimes. Some kids do not go to school, which is ag against the compulsory education law. On the first question, it, it is interesting. I mean, my day job is studying protest and repression. This is just a sideline industry for me with a grad student helping her get a project going and seeing where a paper is in her data. Uh, so that's how we got going on this several years ago. It always strikes me where we go to conferences, I was at one recently where all of the Western scholars talking about protest in China said, oh, they got it under control. They've got, it's just like a puppeteer. They have the right amount of protest, not too much, not too little, not too hot, not too cold. It's just uh, the soup, is, the porridge is exactly the right temperature. And we paint, we paint this picture of the Chinese state as being this magnificent puppeteer, uh, and especially for information reasons, it's learning what's going wrong in society, that's dealing with petitions and protests very effectively, and all of that's true. Then I go to China and I talk to people and they're afraid the world's falling apart. They just want to get to the end of the day without somebody showing up on their doorstep complaining about something. Because all protest goes to the government. It gets there in very short order. Uh, the, the latest numbers are still over 200,000 uh, incidents, mass incidents a year. That's 500 a day going on around the country. And it, it really strikes me that we have been much more impressed by the Chinese state than the people who are in the state are with their ability to control uh, something that can cause them a lot of problems uh, and lead to all kinds of distortions. So a few years ago with petitioners, they started setting up psychiatric hospitals, they started setting up black jails, they set up retrievers because they set up an incentive system at the top where they said if any petitioners from your county get to our get to Beijing, horrible things are going to happen to you. You're all going to lose your bonuses and everything like that. And that led the local governments to go and do these crazy things like setting up psychiatric hospitals and jails and dragging people back and paying bounties to get people to come back. Uh, so I guess one of the things I really am struck by is how we are, those of us who study protest, uh, have bought into a very functional story about how it's serving certain kind of purposes and it's being controlled uh, magnificently by this state who knows just how much to have. Now, I still believe that when there's no protest, it's more dangerous when, than when there is. So if you look at Poland in the 1980s after solidarity was shut down, that's a dangerous situation. So in one sense, it is a sign of confidence that they allow the amount of protest to take place that does. On the other hand, when I talk to local officials, they are scared of this all the time. Migrant workers are one of their greatest concerns and they know what's going on here. They know what's happening. and. Uh, they don't think these people feel completely helpless and powerless and individualized and depoliticized. They see the ones who are uh, actively organizing for it. And some migrant worker activist, Diana Fu, who's right here at Toronto, has been writing about these underground. They've taken it on the chin the most the last three or four years, the people who were organizing uh, migrant workers in one form or another. Uh, so that suggests to me that the, the, the state knows that what these local officials are doing is just barely keeping things at bay right now. And for every person that 
uh, Alexei ran into, who was depoliticized, individualized, and blamed themselves. Others saw through what was going on and know exactly what is happening, and that deflecting is just another kind of denial. That's, uh, that, that can't last forever. That seems like, and that's part of why I say it's a short-term strategy, is uh, people uh, certainly uh, wake up to it at, at some point. Now, they may give up. They may feel like it's hopeless, but that's different than saying they blame themselves. Um, I have maybe one commentary and uh, one question. Uh, I, you mentioned that one risk of this deflecting strategy is like the immigrant workers, they don't know where they can, like which authority especially they can blame for. And I found this quite interesting. And maybe there's also like Chinese law reason of it, because uh, even like the children, they are, their school is deprived by the government, but you cannot say like, I mean, it is in the constitution that education is a right for every single person, but you cannot resolve the constitution in the court. And if it's based on administrative law, then you also need to find a very specific administrative body that are responsible for it, which is quite, maybe quite difficult in an education question. Um, that's my uh, little bit of commentary. And I have one, another question is like, uh, the. Do you think like the deflecting is, uh, it is also happened on maybe like immigration uh, area? I mean like, because like the credit point system is also kind of familiar uh, with how maybe Canada receives immigrants, like how the P PR, like how they become PR and how they calculate that. Um, is there any like a national government also have this kind of deflecting uh, strategy towards migrants generally? In China. Or in other countries. Yeah, I don't know as much about, <laughs> I don't know as much about uh, Canada, but there, and there is certainly an issue about, and Chinese are pretty open in talking about this. There's a term they use, sujur, to mean the quality, and they, they want the quality of migrants to go be higher. And this word sujur, has a vaguely eugenics kind of a feeling to it, that we, we want people who are both economically more able, but people of higher quality. And he's a whitey ren, the outsiders, they're dark, they're dirty, there's, there's a somewhat, uh, um, there's, there's a, a condescension of city people toward country people and other sorts of things that is undoubtedly part of this. So they're sometimes fairly open about wanting to draw people with more education, more income, but also people who are more like us, middle-class, urban Chinese. Uh, so there, there is an element to that, and uh, I think that's, that, that is certainly part of it. Your first question was uh, about... You, you uh, mentioned that the one risk is that the migrant workers they don't know which... Right, yeah, no, that's one of the more interesting things. But you imagine, and this is what I, my, in protest, I've studied something called rightful resistance, where people use policies, laws, and commitments of the state to combat local officials who don't carry them out. People sometimes try that. But it, it rem this paper in particular reminds me, if you make a claim that under the compulsory education law, I have a right to school, the principal says, okay, that's all true, but I've got a classroom. There's already 45 chairs in it. I can't fit 20 more in it. This is above my pay grade. I, I can't resolve this problem here. You need to go talk to somebody else to resolve this problem. My issue is handling this school, and I say there's only room for 45 people. Maybe there really is only room for 45 people. And it's very easy for them to say it's somebody else's uh, problem to resolve. Even if the argument is right, even if the claim is just under the law, uh, it's a, a question of who to prosecute that claim with. And most of Alexia's interviews were right at the interface of state and society. They were the people at the very bottom, the doctors, the nurses, uh, and the parents in conversations with each other. And again, I think you have to have a little bit of sympathy for the people on the ground. Chinese hospitals are overcrowded. They don't have enough resources. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on where they can almost legitimately say, I understand your claim. I understand it's, uh, there's a legal and a moral and another basis for it. I just can't resolve it in the circumstances I'm in. I'm a mid-level administrator at Berkeley right now. I run an institute. And uh, as I was writing this paper, I would think about, I bet I deflect people once or twice a week easily. Once or twice a week, I tell them, oh, yeah, it's a big and an important problem. Go over and talk to this person. They, they're the ones who can really resolve this problem. This is not in my domain. So I think this is a very natural thing to happen at the state-society interface 
when there are certain pressures from above that really are very difficult uh, to resolve right at that level. And uh, it is hard to know who to blame. Uh, is it the school? And uh, is it the hospital? Or is it a bigger structure? Is it the HUCO system? Now, at root, it is the HUCO system. At root, it is big structural things that have to do with the center. But everybody knows it's hopeless to get that changed. You can't get that. You're just trying to sort it out in your school. And if they say it is the HUCO system, what do you as a parent do? Uh, the, the, this, princ this principal or this doctor, can't, this principal can't solve the, the HUCO system. That's, that is truly above his or her pay grade. So I think that's one of the more interesting things about the paper is there how many different people you can, you can blame. And when there are so many different to blame and it's not clear, then you don't know who to blame. Um, so, has this politics of deflecting migrants has become a state ideology, or it is more like local government? It's a know, local adaptation. Strategy that, in fact, it has never been promoted as a sort yeah. of a way of, you know, doing things. Yeah, our view is it's a local adaptation that the central government turns their head away and allows to happen, and knows it's happening while it's busy out of the other side of its mouth saying, give migrants more benefits. Because what's happening? What are the local officials doing? They're complaining and saying, I can't do this. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't have all of this. And the, the central government says, OK, I'll turn away from it. And you develop these tricky ways to prevent mm -hmm. people from getting what they right. think they deserve. Right. OK, then, then the second question is, for this politics of deflecting to work, it would it would need to have some successful cases, right? Meaning, say, you know, people who are able to make it, right? People, are, you, you can't just simply keep deflecting. There must be some cases where people are accepted or, or they have moved up, right? So what happened to, to, to these so-called successful cases? Are they then being promoted as like, you know, this is an example of how you could make it, how you become like, Mobile, like moving up in terms of class, in terms of being able to be part of the urban night. So not successful deflecting, successful getting past the deflecting. Yeah. And that's an interesting question about variation. Are they, are they then being, you know, like promoted or, or how are they presented, right, say by the local government? I, you know, you guys should really look at this example. Well, I know it. They just hide it. <laughs> they just don't want to talk about in it. In the original documentation on, for this paper, I have seen uh, discussions of the point system this way that are wildly over optimistic and give examples of people who accumulated all these points. But if anything, I think those examples lead an ordinary person to look at it and say, there's no way I could ever do all of that. That's just impossible. So in a sense, that, that is a, a good use of a parable to show that you could succeed. And that's a good way to put the blame back on yourself that no, I didn't work hard enough in school. No, I don't have enough money. No, I don't have enough blood to give this summer and to get more points. Uh, so there, there are examples, and they do give examples of all of this working. And undoubtedly, there are some people who do it, who make their way through the system, enough to give you hope. I think it's, it's something I'll mention to Alexia as a good thing to look at, is that if it succeeds, then it may not be destabilizing yeah. in that way. Yeah. If it does, if nobody gets through, then people should relatively quickly realize this is a dupe. This, this is not a third category. This is just a, another kind of denial. And uh, if it's just another kind of denial, then we're back where we were 10 or 15 years ago, where you were denying people, and then that could lead to, to problems. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be curious to see. There are those parables. There are people getting through. Are there an appreciable number of people getting through? Enough that you know somebody who has done it? Enough to keep your nose to the grindstone working to get through? If that's true, then it can last. But there should have to be some successes. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, the, the, the runarounds and things like that, at least I know from a university campus, better than anywhere, I think we all, at, at best what happens is we just give up and we just feel beaten down by the system and we, we just give up. I, I was in a pension dispute with Berkeley years ago and at the end they said, we treat all our faculty fairly, but we are gonna treat you like this and there's nothing you can do about it unless you wanna take us to court. And I said, okay, I'm, I've lost. I, I'm beaten down. Do I continue working? Do I continue showing up and do my job? I do it. Uh, but uh, uh, so this, 
you know, getting beaten down, that can work too, to just think the odds are against you. And then you just accept your lot in life. And I lost two years of pension credit. And uh, they agreed with me right to the end when they sick the university's lawyers on me to tell me to go away. And it um, didn't matter if I was right. didn't matter any of those kind of things. They said, you want to take it to court? We're going to fight it in court. And then we go on about our business. And I, so there, there are a lot of ways at which people can be politicized or depoliticized in this process. And we forget that apathy or giving up can be a strategy after a point and realizing it's just stacked so far against you. Uh, you, you won't do anything about it and uh, you'll put up with second rate education and, and second rate medical services and, and other sorts of things. But I think you're right, some people have to be succeeding or it would be sensible yeah. to have some percentage of people succeeding. Yeah, to stabilize this, this yeah. if, if everybody fails, it can't last, it just can't last. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm a visiting student, come from Chinese uh, Academy of, of Social Sciences, and I come from Beijing. I lived there for 23 years, and I, and, and I studied as a law student for my undergraduate education. So there is something I thought uh, I want to share, then, uh, so you maybe feel it's interesting. Um, about 20 years before, as my parents' generation, is um, when you graduate from um, uh, a school in uh, a college or, or university in Beijing, the government will offer you a job and then offer you a hukou in Beijing. And uh, in that time, studying in Beijing's university seems very attractive because you can be a Beijing citizen, citizen after you graduate. But uh, uh, 10 years Ten years before, uh, if you graduate from Beijing, then you find a job in Beijing. The company will offer you a Beijing hukou after maybe two or three years. When, when the company feel you are val valuable, we, we want to keep you as our worker. Then we will find. Uh, then we will, we will ask for a Beijing hukou from government. Then you will be a Beijing citizen. Um, but to my generation, uh, because I graduated from a law school, so many of my of my uh, uh, of my classmates want want to find a uh, want to find a job as a uh, in, in law in law area uh, when they uh, in law area when they come from other province uh, the only way to become a Beijing citizen is to um, work in, work in government more likely work in court in, in court and it's going to be very uh, very. It's going to be very hard. They must to, they must pass the just uh, examination, which the passing rate is uh, uh, three to five percent. Then they got to pass the civil service examination, which the passing rate is uh, not more than five percent. Uh, after passing those two examinations, they're going to pass the uh, the the test, which holding by the court, and after. After be hired, after hired by court, they're gonna uh, wait wait about five or six years. In during these years, there's there's the slavery goes very uh, quite slow, about eight hundred kind of dollar per month. And uh, after those five or six years, it's only the the, the government probably will offer them a Beijing hukou, and maybe they cannot get a hukou forever, even then, even they pay so much. But if you just want to find a job in Beijing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite much easier than, than that. And uh, everything goes, goes smoothly if you, if you don't have a child. Your child won't, won't uh, study in Beijing, and um, you just want to earn some money or find a, find a high-paid job, it's, it's gonna, the thing's going to be perfect. But once you want your child to uh, study in Beijing, in, in Beijing's primary school or high school, then, then if you don't have a job, it becomes impossible in these years. When I was a high school student, there are some, stu there are some migration students from other provinces. They have they can study with us, but uh, after those three years in high school, they're going to go back to their province and to attend the, uh, the Gaokao as the uh, university uh, ad admission exam in, 
in China, and it's going to be very difficult if you study in, in Beijing's high school and you attend the the, the Gaokao in their own province. Mm -hmm. So many stu more and more students own own study in Beijing high school and uh, then go back to their hometown for the for that exam. Mm -hmm. So I think it seems the social mobility uh, keep go keep goes goes down in the dur during the past twenty years. Well, that that brings up a few interesting points. So getting back to your original question, that if you're a young man or woman without you're healthy and you don't have children and all you need is a job, you can go to Beijing and you can work. You can live outside the hukou system. It's also interesting to hear that the hukou system affects people at very much more exalted levels. I, I don't think you law professors, when you go get a job and you move from one city to another, you think of yourself as a migrant worker. But in China, you are a migrant worker. You move from one city to another. And until you get into that hukou system, you are not even there a full-fledged member of the Beijing community. And it has implications on you that has to be worked out uh, by, your, uh, by your employer uh, to, get, to get you a hukou and to find some way to get you into the system because otherwise you, you don't want to stay. And going home for the Gaokao is very important too yeah. because there are different preferences. It's easier if you're from the big cities to go to a university in a big city. Forcing kids to take the exam at home is another form of discrimination that makes sure that Beijing universities are full of Beijing kids, and Shanghai are full of Shanghai kids. And if you're some, yeah, from some godforsaken place in Hunan, yeah. you have a much, much lower play, chance yeah. of doing it even though you've lived in Beijing your whole life. And remember, we have second generation migrant workers in China now. This is not just first generation. Some of these people were born there and they've, been, they've lived there their whole lives. Uh, and they still are not fully part of the social welfare system. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and there is a word um, written in the government, government document recent year is called the low people. In Chinese it said it means that it doesn't mean Migration workers. It means maybe some someone they don't work in Beijing, but they live in Beijing. As uh, migration workers, their housewife or their parents, they are old and they may have illness, but they, they don't they don't work, but they have to go to hospital in Beijing, but, and they uh, they also do, don't have money and uh, social insurance, and uh, um, maybe sometimes in last year the government from the uh, when the, when the device um, from Beijing is that part of people. It's not the um, uh, not not the migration worker. The worker if you if you can find a job in Beijing then okay then you can offer your uh, then you can uh, then you can pay for your rent. You have you may have a residence. If you if you can have a residence in Beijing since things seems goes much much better than if you live in um, a, a makeshift house and um, and those years, the government cleaned that that uh, that that low areas building, and uh, they didn't even build after after clean that area. They didn't even build some more building in this area. It just turned it, turned this this place to garden or forest or grassland, and so uh, because of that, the rent rent in Beijing. We're going to higher, higher and higher in 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 the future because the because the clean the, the government's clean that that area. I mean, maybe the key figure I gave in the whole paper is that eight percent of public services are paid for by central government, one percent of health, three or four percent of education. Once you do that, now we're in a world of local discretion. I'm not sure how it works in Canada. Is it all at the national level, or is it does the do the uh, provinces have control over these? Education programs and health and uh, most of social welfare is a provincial. Provincial, but the cities seem to have problems. With, although we've been downloaded, a lot of stuff has come down to the city of Toronto now, uh, and we have to pay for these things. But yeah, it, it's a mix. But once well, you start a lot of transfer payments from the federal government to some of the provinces. So places like. China, places like the United States, we don't have those kind of transfer payments. So employment, you, who your employer is, who your municipal leaders are, what your particular migration pattern is, who's coming, who's leaving, where they're from, all those become important. And it's all up to a, a local city to decide what to do with their own revenues. And they've got to do it with their own revenues. So of course you're going to get enormous variation. The, in the thing about local, there was a conversation earlier, some comments about 
that this was really now the, 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 the responsibility of the local government. So th this is devolved on local governments. But actually, the policy is a national policy. And it's always been a national policy in China to limit the size of large cities and to devolve, or to get people into the middle and the That's medium right. and smaller cities. That's a basic policy, and it's part of the 2020 urbanization plan. So how do you do that? Well, you keep the migrants out of the big cities if you can and get them, as you say, deflect them into the medium and smaller cities. So the national policy is really very important. And it's an old policy. It goes back to before the communist takeover. I mean, they used to write about this and talk about I remember Fei Xiaotong, the famous sociologist, he wrote about this as a way of China's way of development. Then the communists came into power, and they also tried to limit the size of big cities, which they couldn't. And now it's still a problem today. And, and the migrants have to take the heat for it. Uh, and one of the listservs I read, Stein Ringing, has been writing in lately where he's arguing China is a totalitarian country. And as I was coming in here today, I was thinking, gee, if it's a totalitarian country, they should be able to keep migrants out of these big cities. And they have not, they cannot or choose not to. And once you allow them to migrate where they want to migrate, then you've created a situation where the municipal officials in these mega cities say, what am I going to do? You tell me to do this, and I can't do it. You've given me an, un in America, we'd call it an unfunded mandate, and I've got to handle it somehow. And if you want to keep them out of the city, I can do what you say. If you're going to let them come in, I can't do it. It's not totalitarian. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of time working in the Soviet Union. Soviet Union under Stalin was totalitarian. China is not totalitarian. It's very authoritarian. But I don't think that I, I yeah. know that debate on the list. Yeah, he's he's, going on right he's now. getting started on it right now. And it just, you know, people just flowing freely across the country. Uh, and you think back to the Cultural Revolution or be, before that, there was not very much free movement. It was not far from saying, we know where everybody slept every night. This is not the situation in China. We don't know where everybody sleeps every night. And uh, uh, this is one of these things where when you study these things, at first it's easy to, to turn the local officials into villains. But one of the more interesting things is to talk to them and to get them to explain the world they live in. I always say one of the basic questions I ask when I'm doing interviewing is, how are the people above you and below you driving you crazy? And they, they always say the people below are of low quality, the people above are idiots. And then they explain for the next two hours the institutions in which they live. And uh, you, you can't be completely gullible and fall for what they say. But there's some truth in what these municipal officials in mega cities are saying. Uh, you tell us. We have to handle these people. You tell us we have to provide services. You don't give us any money. You tell me what to do. And the answer is they come up with something like this. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.